The idea that some ancient civilizations had high technology and engineering, much as we do today, fascinated me. So I enlisted the help of British engineer Christopher Dunn. But before we met in Egypt, I visited him at the Danville Metal Stamping Plant. Okay, we moved beyond now what it takes to actually cut something. How, how were they checking it? You know, how were they guiding that tool? Uh, uh -huh. Because okay. obviously they had to have had some metrology instruments. They had to engage metrology instruments to be able to verify that they were maintaining parallelism between this surface and the opposing surface right there. Uh, and you just don't get that by line of sight or saying, you know, oh, that, that's good enough. We'll get Joe on the job today because he's got really good eyesight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, I, I could go with some, some of that in small grooves and stuff like you're saying there, but that one. I mean, and so basically the conclusion on, on these artifacts and a lot of the other artifacts that we look at is, you know, they were using tools that no longer exist. They're no longer, they're not in the archaeological record anymore. They do not exist anywhere. And so then the question is, okay, what are the minimum requirements? What are the minimum, what's the minimum tooling level or uh, technology, if you will, to be able to do this? And, and that, this is the most striking example where people just go, whoa. Because well, for, for, for you as an engineer and also a, uh, an expert machinist, corners, inside corners, mean something to you, right? Sure. Yeah. Five thirty seconds of an inch inside corner on those boxes, top to bottom. Now that photograph's a little blurred. Now th that's not two pieces coming together? No. No, it's cut that's out just of a, a solid, square granite square, fillet, solid block, consistent all the way down. Mm -hmm. yep. And why would they really have to be so precise? Is what blows my mind. Now this is how they would, you know, conventionally they would say this is how they they built something like that, and then for. Uh, Squaring something off, of course, you know, the, the way a carpenter will square a frame, obviously measure from corner to corner, mm -hmm. which <clears throat> is a low tech compared to what we have here. And you can't, you can't verify that with a piece of string. I mean, you, you know, that kind of precision, you can't verify with a piece of string. So that, that's what we're faced with, and there's not just one there. It's not like they got lucky on one box. There's over 20 of them in this facility, down in the rock tunnels at the Serapeum near the Saqqara in Egypt. So I'm back to they had, like you mentioned earlier, they had hundreds and hundreds of people spending hours and days and months and years doing this stuff. But let me, let me take you back to the the historical information on the on the Serapeum. Okay, you know what they were supposed to be using for those boxes? They were burying the Apis bull, which was a revered animal. Okay, the Apis bull's lifespan is supposed to be 28 years, and they say that when an Apis bull was selected, uh, they would start building his burial tomb. This is uh, Egyptologist. Is that what they say? Right. Okay, yeah. you know, really. mm -hmm. so. 28 years. Now, they've also done uh, some time studies on how fast they can remove granite using the ancient Egyptian tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you use the material removal rate of the old methods and the multiply that out down, huh? by the time, you know, using the maximum number of workers that you can actually get in the work at the work site. And you're not talking 28 years, you're talking 50 plus years. Mm. And that's, it, that's just roughing the bloody thing out. That's not even lapping it. Finished. So now we're talking power tools, right? Exactly. Okay, right. Exactly. Yeah. From what I'm seeing, they're 
tool. I'm looking at that picture, and there's tool marks on it. Mm -hmm. Anything mm -hmm. we machine, though, most of what we machine, there there are tool marks. You just don't see them because they're so minute. Mm -hmm. But also because of the the feet of the tool controls yeah. that surface finish. Mm -hmm. If you plow down through a piece of any kind of material, you're going to have a rougher surface. Mm -hmm. If you go slower, the feed rate's slower, the RPMs are faster, you're going to have a nicer, smoother finish. Mm -hmm. So this blows me out of the water a little bit because of those tool marks. That te That's telling me they wasted no time cutting through this thing. Okay, it's yeah, really now, bad. I mean, I've like, been talking lapping and all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a feed rate of a 100,000th per revolution, which you bet it'd be difficult to achieve that in aluminum using carbide tools, okay. let alone in granite. Right. And, okay. You know, so basically, what you're looking at is a something that is only explained if you consider non-conventional types of machining. My first impression was, with very little historical background, that all this was done by hand. It was lapping and chiseling and, and took many hours, days, weeks, took a, lot, a large amount of time. But after looking at some of the, uh, gra or the uh, granite that I've seen, I question if it was even feasible to do by hand. And it kind of leads me into directions of thinking about the application of machine tools, for lack of a better, um, some time ago. I think all the evidence in Egypt indicates that there was a high civilization in prehistory. Now when we look at the tools and the technology available to the ancient Egypt, we have to consider that the culture that built the pyramid, that built all these other monuments, was far older because the tools do not exist for that particular epoch. So it doesn't matter what site you go to in Egypt, whether it's Abu Ghraib, Abu Rawash, whether you're going to the temples in Upper Egypt, uh, there is always some signature of technology and that signature is actually the machine tools that we used and the marks that they left in the stone. And those marks are not just the cutting marks but the geometry of the stone. I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's an exaggeration to assume that a culture that has the genius to devise these wonderful miracles of engineering, limited that expertise and genius with just the design of the product. They had to have had the tools to match the job. According to Chris's theory, the ancients not only had electricity, but they had power tools as well. Chris shares my interest in ancient technology, so I had him take me around Giza for a day to look at things from an engineer's perspective. <laughs> 